Welcome to Brevis Talk. The talks you are about to hear will be honest, revealing, and unfiltered. Join us as your host, Pastor Wayne Whiteside, lifts the lid of silence and has conversations about mental illness and health in the church. The goal here is simple. It is to help someone along this journey of life who is struggling. It is to tell the truth to the unsuspecting, and it is to lighten the load of a fellow traveler. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to serve as medical advice or to replace consultation with your physician or mental health professional. If you are experiencing a medical crisis, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne. Welcome. You have found yourself at another Brevis Talk. I do need to warn you, this episode is extremely disturbing. And if you choose to listen, please to know that it is not suitable for all audiences. Let's start with a verse of Scripture, too. Matthew chapter 7 tells us, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. And then jumping over a little bit in Matthew chapter 7, the same chapter, every tree that brings not forth good fruit, it is cut down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not every one that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out demons, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then will I confess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity." The final statement of an inmate is he lay strapped down on the gurney in the death chamber. I would like to say a final prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord, and thank you for the opportunity would be to be with you in paradise. I ask you for forgiveness for the ones that need to be forgiven. Dear Lord, deliver us from evil and give us the comfort and peace and joy that we need. Dear Lord, I ask you right now to be with each of the witnesses and lift them up and be on solid ground. Let them know what has gone on, and may we all see each other again. Amen. I would like to thank each witness, Cox, Whiteside, Reed, Scott, and Chad. I am going to go and see Jesus tonight and reserve a special place for each of you. You've all been there when I had no one else. Thank you all. Thank you for all of your love and support. You just know that I am ready to go. You all know what I've gone through. I'm going to a better place with the Lord. I'm mad for one reason, that I'm leaving you behind when I'm going to a better place. You'll still have to go through this hell on earth, Just remember the good things and not the bad. You are loved and respected. Warden, just give me parole and let me go home to be with the Lord. The inmate received a lethal dose of a three-drug protocol and was pronounced deceased eight minutes later. We're going to call this inmate Don today in an abundance of caution to protect the victim's family. This case remains one of the most disturbing cases to my mind and psyche. The reasons are it involves children. The inmate was one of the weirdest and strange people I have ever met. And although I don't know anyone's heart, my heart is distressed over this inmate's soul. I feel no peace or confidence that his profession of faith was sincere or heartfelt. He always seemed to be playing a game, 
with everyone who tried to help him, game after game after game, word games, like a cat and mouse or a chess game. He said a lot, but he didn't say anything. He would wait on you. He would read you. He read people who visited him. And then he would give you what he thought you needed or what you thought you wanted. Very, very intelligent. If he found out that you were a sports fan, he would talk sports. Your favorite team became his favorite team. And on and on we could go. He could talk a multitude, a multitude of uh, topics. Again, I said he was intelligent, but he was a game player. I've done this long enough that I feel like I'm not infallible, but I feel like I know when someone is playing a game. Now, I still get duped. I still get taken down the street or down a dead-end road or a tangent. I'm absolutely not 100% uh, able to read someone. But I have spent enough time and enough hours over the years to know this man and to know, if you will, his modus, his uh, thought process. And that's why I have really no peace or confidence concerning his profession of faith. He gave us the minister friends he had and those that tried to help him. He gave us back what it was he thought that we wanted to have. He's very good. He's very good at this. He could quote the Romans Road uh, witnessing tool, Romans Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Romans 6, verse 23, and then Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13. He had that memorized. He would readily give it if he thought that's what you needed. You say, well, he had Scripture in his heart. No, he had it in his mind. And I would remind you that the devil himself knows Scripture. He knows it better than we do. And it was the devil himself who tried to twist Scripture when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He turns truth. It's off a little bit, and a half-truth is a lie. He questioned God's words to Adam and Eve in the garden. And so he is a conniving slippery enemy. So don't be impressed with people just because they can quote Scripture. It is whether they have fruit in their life. That is the question that you should ask. He was cunning, very deceptive, had non-answers, half-truths, and lies. And I know now that you've have heard a little bit of what I say. You say, well, you're really hard on this guy. You're angry at him. Uh, You didn't like him. And none of that is the case. I'm not angry at him. I didn't dislike him. It would be hard not to like him. He was so charming. But I'm greatly disappointed, and I feel like I should always speak truth. And I'm just telling you the truth about my experiences. And as I have look back and tried to process this and that you know I've looked at it from every angle what would I have said what would I have done differently and so I have thought about this a great great deal I've spoken to other ministers who spoke to this inmate they shake their heads and say never met anything like him before or since he was one strange duck if you will One time in our conversation, I said to him, you do know that I know that you are lying. Do you want to back up and retell that? He simply changed the subject and nothing more was said about his lie. It was especially deceptive to the women in his life. It was able to play them against one another, and it seemed as if he would sit back and enjoy the strife that he had caused. He had them turned against one another. They were arguing against one another. He made them jealous of one another. And he would tell them, because I've had conversations with them, you're the only person who's ever understood me. There's never been anyone else. I feel like you and I are soulmates. And he told that to several different individuals. All ladies, I'm not saying ladies are easier to deceive. I'm just saying here that he knew how to play the opposite sex. 
smooth, smooth, a Teflon tongue. I always, again, I always felt like he was playing different roles to different people. I felt like he thought he was more intelligent than anyone else. He had that air about him. The afternoon before Don was executed, I asked him if he was going to make a final statement. Most choose to give a final statement, but some do not. And I always felt like, as a spiritual advisor, that was something I should help the inmate to think about and consider before the execution. Always tell them not to be hurtful. If they have children sometimes, I will appeal to them that their children might read it one day. And of course, I tell them that profanity is out of the line. If you want to offer an apology, certainly that's something good. And if you feel like you should do that, you need to do that. But I caution them to not do what so many people do in offering an apology. And that's whether you're in prison or in the free world. And that is to give an apology and then take it back by trying to defend or justify yourself. I've seen many a person nullify their apology. I am very sorry for what I've done. I can't tell you how bad I feel feel about this, but if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that. Or I'm very sorry that I've hurt your feelings. Now, if you understood my side of the story you might feel different. And and on and on, apologies that are written in pencil and then erased in a matter of moments after the apology has been given. And being with inmates during their last minutes and hearing many of the last statements, I've heard those that I thought were said with much humility and caused no more pain to the victim's family or their own family. And then there have been those that stunned and shocked me because they were nothing like the inmate had said they would be like. They caused more pain and seemed to nullify their Christian profession. Once after an execution where this particular inmate raged and said very ugly, hurtful, and false things to a victim's family. I was walking out of the prison. And an officer who I had grown to know over the years spoke to me and said something to the effect of, Reverend, that man sure wasn't one of your success stories. Whoever said that ministry was messy and unpredictable got it right. It's messy and unpredictable in the prison and in the free world. Dealing with people is not one, two, three, ABC. It's nothing that you can count on the reaction or the response. I've been greatly disappointed to hear some of the last words of individuals. You heard Don's final witness at the beginning of this episode. It was bizarre, and it seemed to me to be an effort to display how humble and spiritual he was. It definitely seemed to be some rehearsed for an audience. I read that final statement, and you have the way I read it. You have my voice. Uh, you don't have the emotions. You do not have the uh, the nuances of the facial expressions, all of those things that uh, he gave as he gave his last statement. I certainly didn't think it was sincere. I thought it came across as him saying the right things to, concerning people that were there that they wanted to hear. There was this uh, individual who had befriended him, an elderly person, very, very sweet person, but very, very gullible. And to say Don took this person for a ride is an understatement. And to the very end, this individual today, if you were able to talk to this person, would say that he is an innocent man. He was falsely accused. He was falsely convicted and falsely imprisoned and falsely executed. This person would never, ever come off of that belief. They never let all of the truth, all of the facts come in. They made their mind up based upon Don's cunningness. Some people claimed he was innocent again. In all 
I really said instructive about his final statements when I talked to him. Again, some thought he was innocent because he claimed to be innocent. All I really said instructive about his final statement was, don't let the last words on your lips before you meet God be a lie. And I have certainly said that to more than one person. He called each of us by name. His attorneys had witnessed him die. One of them appeared to become lightheaded, and the prison officials moved toward him, making sure he didn't fall. This was the same one who had asked me about being a witness earlier. He was very, very unsure, and I really thought he would excuse himself from attending. I remember telling him, whatever you see, you can't unsee. And I'm fairly certain today that he wished he had not been there. This is free information. I give this to others. Media witnesses are at every execution. I caution people who are going to be witnesses. Don't say anything out loud that you don't want to see printed or broadcast. The media is present, and they are listening and observing. Not saying anything has served me well over the years of witnessing executions. Twice the media has put my name out as being a witness. Both times it was local newspapers in the area which the crime was committed. Okay, the case. Don became the prime suspect in the case, but insufficient evidence existed to put him under arrest at that time. And for the next year and a half, a detective with the sheriff's department of this particular county tried to solve the case. He befriended Don. He drank with him. He even let him accompany him on official business, all in an effort to build a rapport that might lead to a confession. The dedication of this detective is amazing. He spent his own personal money. He was not on the clock while doing all of this. He was dedicated to solving this case and to helping the victim's family. There might not have ever been an arrest if this officer had not been so dedicated. One evening, the deputy detective asked Don to come to his office and discuss the case. They ended up talking for four hours. And then Don told authorities in a six-page confession that he was upset about being fired from his job that day when he confronted the girls. He told police that he killed them using techniques he had learned in the Marines. And I am using names that are not the victims' names here. Police said Linda, age 7, and Leah, age 10, also were sexually assaulted. But Don never confessed to this. The killings took place in mid-afternoon in Leah's home. Three doors down and across the street, Linda's mother was at home caring for her caring for her one-month-old son. Directly across Leah's home, a group of boys, ranging in age from 11 to 15, and including Leah's 15-year-old brother, had played outdoors much of the day. Two witnesses told detectives they saw the girls in Leah's front yard somewhere around 3 p.m. Less than 45 minutes later, their bodies were discovered. Both girls were found by Leah's brother, lying face down on a blood-soaked bed in his bedroom, dressed only in T-shirts. Lee had been stabbed 18 times. Linda had been stabbed 23 times. Both of the little girls were stabbed in the eyes and the neck area. They were nude from the waist down. Linda's mother remembers walking down the street her one-month-old baby in her arms. There were around 10 police officers outside Leah's home. She pleaded with the officials, tell me that my daughter is okay. And they remained silent. Finally, a paramedic turned to her and answered, no, ma'am, she's not. 
The investigation into the murders was badly sidetracked in its first hours by Leah's neighbor, who gave investigators descriptions of suspects who did not exist. That neighbor was Don. Two days later, after failing two polygraph tests, the neighbor, Don, admitted he had lied in telling them that he had seen two men, one black and one Hispanic. They were climbing over his fence just before the girls' bodies were discovered, according to Don. Don told detectives he did not get a good look at the Hispanic, but helped a police artist come up with a composite of the black suspect, who became the focus of the investigation. After killing the children, Don sat outside in a lawn chair, drinking a soft drink, watching as police blanketed the area. Don's neighbor heard about the description of the suspects that Don had given, and he told the officers that I do not believe Don's statement because Don would do anything for attention. It was 18 months after the murders that Don would give a six-page detailed confession. Don would give information that only the murderer would know. A jury would sentence Don to death. Ten years, two months, and four days after the deaths of Linda and Leah, Don would be executed. There's some interesting, if not bizarre, background to this story and this inmate. Number one, Don did volunteer work. He entertained children as a clown. Secondly, while Don was on death row and had not been executed, I had a phone conversation with a lady who was a communications person at a church. Somewhere in the conversation, she mentioned Don and asked if I knew him. We had been talking about prison ministry and things. I told her, yes, that I visit him from time to time and try to minister to him. And I asked her how she knew him. Her response was simply, he killed my daughter. I don't think I've ever wanted to be away from a conversation. I felt stunned, bad, and so regretful at the same time. I profusely expressed my sorrow to this lady and for her family. And she was gracious to me, and she told me that I'd done nothing wrong and that please don't feel bad about this. Well, that moment was so much like being hit with lightning that I can still hear her voice, and it's been almost 20 years. I continue to pray for this sweet lady. Her son found his sister and his sister's friend. He was certainly traumatized, according to this lady and the information she offered me. Her husband, of course, his heart is broken. And, of course, everyone who was a part of that moved out of this neighborhood. They could not stay. Two days after the execution on a Thursday morning at 8 a.m., I was standing beside a freshly dug grave in a prison cemetery. Uh, many people aren't aware of this, but over the years, some cemetery boards have put a stop to any thoughts that a family might have of burying an inmate who has Don's background or something similar. This is especially true concerning pedophiles. At that graveside, I read a short obituary. I read from Scripture. I spoke to the family about God's love for them and His comfort, and then concluded with a prayer. There were three family members present his mother, his brother, and his sister-in-law. After the service, we all began to walk away from the grave toward our cars. And then the brother called out to me. He came to me. He got up close. He whispered. He said, was he guilty? I looked at him. I looked at him trying to read him. And it is as if he begged me. And he said something to the effect, please tell me something. He's always told us he was innocent. At least give me your opinion. Please don't let me leave here without something. 
So I thought for a moment. I told him about scolding his brother for the games that he played with people. And in one of those conversations, he looked down toward the floor and said, I'm not fooling you. I am not innocent, and you know that. And then he went far, far away from that conversation, and the subject was never revisited. So from his lips, I, I can tell you, speaking to the brother, he said, I'm not innocent. This brother who had pain in his eyes hugged me and simply said, thank you. Thank you for visiting. Thank you for stopping by for another Brevis Talk. And that concludes our broadcast today. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, check us out at our Facebook page or at brevistalk.com and take a look at our blog. And remember, be kind. Always be kind. <laughs>